نبدا اخت فاطمه واخت موزه اه دقائق خلاص بنبدا ان شاء الله uh, welcome everyone from the private sector uh, from attending the workshop today and uh, welcome mr nasser safi ceo of ajman csr and mr ms aisha hilal head of the ajman csr and ms khulud al hindi uh, sustainability and social impact advisor Uh, we are glad. We are tru uh, truly glad with your presence in the effective platform. It is our pleasure to to see you here today. Now we are we will introduce Miss Aisha Hilal. Uh, she is the head of Ajman CSR social, for social responsibility. Miss Aisha, please may have your speech. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to I'm using the uh, same user of Moza, my colleague, because I have, I think, some technical issue on my laptop. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our workshop today. Uh, we are talking about the role of uh, social responsibility in managing environmental risks. Uh, I hope, inshallah, all the attendees benefit from uh, today's uh, workshop. And uh, also, inshallah, this uh, workshop will raise your awareness of importance uh, of social responsibility managing environmental risk. Uh, welcome, Khalid, um, and um, you have now your speech. Thank you, Ms. Aisha. Uh, Ms. Khalid, you can start uh, conduct the workshop, please. Thank you so much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Aisha, for the introduction, and thank you, Moza, for inviting me, and thank you for uh, Nasr. Um, Training Center for inviting me to do this um, really important uh, session. Um, and um, we will uh, start now. So um, just I wanted to make sure that my screen is clear um, and everyone can see it. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. 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 So um, again, my name is Khulud Hindiya. I am uh, a sustainability and uh, social impact advisor. So my trip, I have almost 18 years of experience in this field. Um, I got my master's degree in sustainability from the University of Nottingham. And uh, this is my, um, uh, my internal belief. And my uh, quote that I always use is that sustainability inside out. And this is the uh, my slogan that I use always because I totally believe that sustainability should start internally and then we go outside. Um, I am an accredited um, certified advisor uh, and practitioner in measuring social impact and environmental impact. Uh, from Social Value International. This came in 2016 because when practicing sustainability and implementing sustainability projects, we came to realize that we need to identify if all these projects, they are creating the impact that we want. They're changing lives. They're doing people's lives better in terms of environmental or social or economic. So. This passion was translated in getting this certification. And alhamdulillah, I became also the, the first certified trainer uh, in uh, measuring social impact using the methodology of social return of investment. In Arabic, we call it al-a'id al-ijtima'i ala al-istithmar, which measures the impact of any social or environmental project in terms of, of, uh, of financial returns. And I have provided several training courses, mentorship, um, consultation with uh, different organizations. Sorry, I have also the certification from Duke University on measuring social impact on the SDGs. Uh, and there are new, new um, um, uh, standards to measure the impact on the SDGs from the UNDP. So these are some of the organizations that I worked with as a consultant to either to build up their sustainability strategies or to do sustainability reports or sustainability or uh, impact reports and impact strategies. Um, and I'm really glad that um, this is for the second year that we're doing this type of um, sessions um, with, this, with the Ajman Center for CSR. And I'm really glad uh, that this momentum is 
is getting bigger and larger. And um, these are the aspects that we will be talking about today. So first we will start with the definitions and history, like what is sustainability, what is CSR, uh, what is ESG, what are the SDGs, and all these terms that we've been using and, and we have been listening a lot. What are the current approaches? What are the types of environmental risk? And what are the actions to, to reduce environmental risk or to manage the environmental risks? So please, this is a session. So I, um, if you have any question, if you have any doubts or any comment, just any time, please unmute yourself and um, uh, explain what you have. It's, uh, I would really like to see some interactions if you have any questions, and I'm sure you have a lot as well to give. Um, sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to um, open my camera. Yeah. So um, this, this is what we will be um, talking about during um, the session. So first, we will be talking about sustainability. I'm sure most of you know what is sustainability. In Arabic, we call it a tenmian mustadame. And to, sorry, note as well, if you want a term to translate it into Arabic, also just let me know. Um, so uh, what is sustainability? Sustainability has been, has been officially, let's say, defined by the UN um, uh, during the, uh, the, the UN Branded Land uh, Commission. They said that it is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their, their own needs, which in another terms, it is about how to reach the development or how to do the development by using the current resources, like the environmental resources, the human resources, and the uh, financial resources, but without compromising the ability of our children and our children's children and all the generations to come to use the same resources that we are using now. So to use the same environmental resources, to use the same human resources that we are using now. So this is what, what makes us think, are we really acting responsibly and in a sustainable way or not? And one important aspect about sustainability is that it tackles three dimensions of responsibility. First, the environmental responsibility, the economic social responsibility, and the economic responsibility. So it's social, environmental, and economic. So what is the difference between sustainability and CSR is that CSR is one small dimension under the bigger umbrella of sustainability. Because if we focus only on the social development, while neglecting the environmental and the economic, we will not definitely achieve sustainable development. And if we focus on the environmental and economic without the society, we will not achieve sustainable development. So this, we need to achieve like a balance between all these three dimensions uh, of sustainability to be able to achieve what we want. So the history, how did it all start? Is this something new or is it something that has been started since history? So um, since history, it started with the concept of philanthropy in Arabic, So since history, companies or, or businessmen used to give back to the society or to make good actions to the society out of their religious beliefs or out of their ideological beliefs that, yes, we need to give back to the community, we need to give back to the environment, the concept of zakah, the concept of sadaqat. This is the main driver behind giving back to the community or doing good to the community. But then after that, during the 50s, and in specific during the Industrial Revolution, where, where companies and industries started to really be um, uh, very strong in terms of economic development and, and social development. However, they started to make, uh, um, or they started to, uh, to impact negatively the, com the community in terms of increasing 
uh, unemployment rates, poverty, increasing the gap between the social levels, like the, um, uh, the, the medium level and the poor or the rich people, like the gap between the different layers in the community started really to be higher. So when these social, let's say, problems started to occur, the concept of CSR, it raised up in the 50s, where companies, they have to give back to the community beyond what is required legally by them, like beyond what is economically required or legally required by them, they have to take voluntarily actions to do some CSR actions or CSR activities. And then during this time, the industries and the companies, they caused environmental problems at the same time in the 50s. However, the environmental issues and the catastrophes, they have, they need long term, they need some time to revolve and to be seen. That's why in the 1990s, when the environmental catastrophes started to occur, and when many environmental problems such as air pollution, such as increase in temperature, they started to really be a major problems and they're starting to impacting our health. The concept of sustainability started to occur. They have different terms of sustainability, like uh, uh, company responsibility, such as uh, uh, corporate citizenship, such as circular economy, different concepts it, it started to raise, where, while asking companies to really take care of their environmental emissions, their social impact, as well as to their economic uh, development, just to make sure that they are acting sustainably and they're making profits but at the end, making profit through doing good, through taking care of their environmental impact and uh, social development as well. So after, so after sorry, after sustainable development, what do you think is the next step? Who can who have an idea? It's not a step, but it's something that we need to take into consideration. And I've mentioned this when I first started my session. And I mentioned it on purpose because I wanted to hear from you. Like, it's not the evolution, but it is a step that comes hand in hand with implementing sustainability projects or environmental projects or social projects. What do you think is the next step? Who can, who can share with me their thoughts? Uh, what actions should we take? What, what is the term? that comes with sustainable development to make sure that we are really doing good and changing lives. What's the word or what is the terminology? Any thoughts? I can't see hands. Um, so if there's any hand, just um, unmute yourself because I'm, I'm Mr. Mohammed has Mr. Mohammed has a hand. Oh. Okay, Mr. Muhammad, sorry, but because I can't see the hands. Yeah. Tfaddal, Mr. Muhammad. Hello? If Mr. Muhammad is with us, um, you can share your thought. Okay, maybe um, maybe there was something wrong. I think okay. there is something. Yeah, so I will uh, I will proceed. If there's uh, no other hand, right, uh, Fatima? You're Fatima, right? Uh, no. Okay, so the the term is impact. This is what we have to do. This is what we need to make sure that. As I said, for any social project or any environmental project, we need to check its impact. In Arabic, يعني الأثر. يعني, did I create the real change that is needed on the community or the society and on the environment because of this project? And you will be amazed with the amount of changes, sometimes negative changes, that happens from very common projects that you have been implementing and and without noticing it because sometimes we implement projects and usually we intend to look at 
at um, planned objectives. Are they achieved or not? If they are achieved, then the project is successful. If they are not achieved, then we need to work more to achieve these objectives. But we don't look farther and further than the objectives. And that's why it is this concept started to evolve a lot now after being recognizing that um, these SDGs, or they are connected with the SDGs. I'm sure you all know these SDGs, right? The, just a quick note, the SDGs, or Al-Ahdaf Al-Alamiya Al-Tanmiya Al-Mustadama, these SDGs were out or launched by the UNDP in 2015, requesting from all governments, private sector, public sector, even individuals, to work to achieve them by 2030. So in 2015, they gave a time or a period of 30 year, 15 years to be able to achieve these 17 development goals. So these development goals, they are, if you look more into them, you will notice that these 17 goals, some of them are related to the community or the social development, some of them for environmental development and some of them for economic development, which are the, as we said, the three dimensions of sustainability, social, environmental, and economic. So for example, if we look at um, SDGs from one uh, to five, it is social related, like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, these are all social related goals. And if you look at six, for example, seven, these are environmental related goals. And also like 13, 14, 15, they are all environmental related. And if we look at SDG number eight, nine, it is economic related because they are asking for economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, which this one is related to circular economy, how to make sure that I am producing responsibly and consuming responsibly. Uh, so all these SDGs, as I said, are related to social, environmental, and economic. And within these 17 development goals, there are 169 targets. Because for example, uh, SDG number one, no poverty, it has like five or six targets. What does it mean? Or what are the targets that we need to achieve in order to achieve this goal? And we say, yes, we are there, we, are, we, we achieve no poverty goal or zero hunger or for the rest of them. So all these 17 goals, there are 169 targets that I really advise you all to check them and to check if um, um, which of these targets are related to your operations, to your business and to your daily, day-to-day uh, -day work and uh, scope of work. So a question that I have from you now, my question is, just a, just a quick thought. Do you think these goals are achievable or are we able to achieve them by 2015 or not? What do you think? And please, yes or no on the chat. Are we able to achieve these goals by 2015 or not? Just on the chat. Uh, sorry, by 2030. By 2030. Just a chat, yes, no, achievable, not achievable, worldwide. I'm not saying only uh, locally, just worldwide. Yes, we have Khadija, yes, Maryam, yes. Great, as I said, globally. Lubna, yes. Great, very optimistic. Uh, partially achievable. Siham, Ahmed, yes. Borsu, no, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correct. <laughs> yeah, Borsu is the only one who says no. Do we have other people who says no? Stewarding team, yes. Hamda, yes. Very good. Muhammad, yes. Okay. 
So I'll give you more facts and I'll ask you the question again. Okay, um, maybe you need some numbers. Let's get some facts. Facts about the SDGs. Total amount of investments that are made to achieve the SDGs, total amount of investments were around 1.3 to 1.2 uh, to 1.3 billion dollars till 2021. Wow, this is huge. And this makes us more confident that yes, we will be able to achieve these SDGs, right? Did anyone change their opinion? Let me check again the chat. Pessimistic, sorry for, <laughs> yeah. So now after all these, we have, after the fact that we said, yes, we have been investing a lot to achieve these SDGs. What do you think? We have a hand, but I can't see who. If anyone is raising your hand, please unmute yourself and share what you have. Mr. Ali has a hand. Yes, please go ahead. Mr. Ali, um, you can unmute yourself. Okay, that may be my, maybe my mistake. So, yeah, still we have some pessimistic um, uh, chats that yes, we can achieve these SDGs because we have a huge amount of investments. Despite these investments, and I am with Bursu, despite these, I, I try to be optimistic, but to be able to achieve these goals by 2030, as I said, they were launched in 2015 to be achieved by 2030. To be able to achieve them by 2030, total annual investments in SDG related sectors only in the SDGs in developing countries, we will need $3.3 trillion to $4.5 trillion annual investments that are needed. And at the rate of progress that we were in till 2019, we would need till 2082 before being able to achieve the SDGs. This is according to um, the World Benchmarking Alliance and according to the IFC records. The SDGs will not be able to be achieved by 2030 and we will be able to achieve them only by 2083. And this was before COVID. And after COVID, at 10 years, so 2019 maybe. So these are the facts. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be pessimistic again, but these are the facts that we are living in. Uh, so what do you think are the reasons why despite all these investments that we have been doing, despite all the programs, I'm saying globally, that we have been doing, and calling for sustainability projects, sustain environmental programs, solar energy, all these types of initiatives, we are still lagging behind. So there are many reasons. Some of them are political, some of them are uh, environmental, some of them are uh, uh, systematic, strategic uh, awareness. So what do you think in your opinion? Also, you can write me in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, whatever is suitable for, for you. Already, already there is in chat. Sorry? Uh, Miss Falot, you can check in the chat. Yeah. So we have uh, Siham, lack of commitment. I totally agree with Siham. Like lack of commitment, it is one of the main reasons that I totally agree with. And how does that, how does that, like if Siham, if you would like to tell us more, what do you mean by lack of commitment? And after that, I can also share what do I think in the lack of commitment. Siham, would you like to share with us? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, so basically when I'm talking about the lack of the commitment, uh, mainly it can be noticed from the private sector. So when they are mm -hmm. talking about mainly the ESG or like, uh, when they are talking about sustainability is like more about 
greenwashing than committing to the purpose of the sustainability. So it's used okay. nowadays. It's used nowadays to to greenwash the company to get mm-hmm. like more of IPO, this thing, more of like investments, more of economic impact, rather than focusing on the purpose of the sustainability, which was stated in the beginning of the presentation. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Siham. Like you picked up the right words, let's say, and the lack of commitment, as you said, because, uh, and I will talk about it now, we lack a strategy. And when you lack a strategy for sustainability or for the SDGs, and not only, not all the SDGs we will talk now, you will not have a commitment. So your actions and your sustainability projects will be like the hit and run strategy and the hit and run approach. What do we mean by hit and run? It's ad hoc. It's scattered, you know, it depends on what is famous now, maybe, or what is going on in the countries now, we do it. This is one dimension of having it. And this leads us to being, or to, 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 to for greenwashing, which means different dimensions. For example, first of all, if companies or organizations, whether we're talking about private sector or public sector or NGOs, they launch sustainability reports, because I had many questions from organizations like Khulud, can you help us write our sustainability reports? I say, okay, yes. But my first question is, do you have a strategy? They say, no, we don't have a strategy. So why do we, why are we launching sustainability reports without having a strategy? Because if we launch reports without a strategy, we are meaning that we're, we're brain, we're, we're greenwashing, as Siham says, we're just doing it for the sake of marketing uh, or, or check out of the list. And we're doing it just sometimes we do many activities that we go do something good for the community or for the environment, take pictures, put it on social media and say, yeah, we're doing it. Uh, so we have uh, Bursu as well, uh, lack of resources, coordination of governments, exactly. Instability, wow, we have big one here. Uh, instability, inequality, tech and infrastructure gaps, exactly. Like all of these aspects, maybe, um, if uh, Bursu, would would you like to share with us your, your comments? Because I love all the points that you have mentioned, if you'd like to um, tell us what you think. You can't hear? Yes, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. عليكم السلام خديجة أحمد مدينة الشارجة الخدمات الإنسانية شكرا على هذه الورشة المحاضرة القيمة Thank you for all this workshop about the sustainability and the social responsibility As we are in Sharjah City Humanitarian Service we have been since 1979 and we are implement the SDG in our sustainability report as we mm-hmm. have sustainability report every year and we implement the goals which it is aligned with us with our uh, our work mm-hmm. and uh, yes we can achieve our goals what we are it is uh, working on it and we are publishing that in our sustainability report and you can see that in our site is the uh, Sharjah City Humanitarian Service. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I loved what you mentioned and what you have said, uh, um, Sid Khadija, because you said that we are aligning our businesses to the SDGs. If you noticed what she has said, because some companies, but I'm, I'm just sharing what I have been hearing from companies while working with them from my experience. Some companies, they say, okay, these SDGs are really sometimes they are overwhelming. But the thing is that you shouldn't align your business with all of these SDGs. You should only look at your business strategies, what you are doing, what you are focusing on, what do you want to achieve, okay? And based on that, you choose the SDGs that helps you achieve your business objectives. At the end, the business of business is what? It's business, right? But we're calling to do good business and we're not calling to dispatch or to disconnect 
the sustainability strategy or sustainability practices from your business practices. They should go hand in hand. They should go aligned with each other. And this will be talking about in the second half. Uh, but anyway, I always like to talk about strategies. And because this is one of the main reasons that makes us not being able to achieve the SDGs because they are scattered efforts, you know, scattered efforts. Um, we repeat, uh, there are duplication of efforts. There are no centrality, no, nothing centralized. Um, yes, narrow it down and focus on those you can realistically achieve exactly. So there are many, let's say, um, um, challenges that we are facing and we really need to take care of. And as you are advocates in sustainability, uh, you, need, you really need to take care of us. So despite all the efforts that we're doing in sustainability, let's face it, the environmental problems are increasing, right? We're seeing an increase in the overall global temperature and it's very alarming and it's very critical. And now there's, we're saying that, what are the efforts that we should do to minimize the increase in temperature above now we reach 1.5 degrees Celsius and we shouldn't increase this. And the environmental catastrophes, we're seeing it all around. The extreme weathers that we're seeing, the extreme rainfall that we're seeing, the floods that unfortunately we saw in Libya. So these environmental problems need to be tackled by everyone, not as a sustainability advocate or also as a human being. And we have been seeing many social problems. Um, so this is what we have been saying. Um, so let, let me tell you another, another um, claim that I will go back to, to the definition of ESG. I will give you another facts that you should also look at. So um, the PwC, they did a beautiful um, report and uh, assessment in 2019 to see how, how um, realistically and how strongly companies are adopting the SDGs into their practices. Because as we said, it's not about greenwashing, it's about really adopting the SDGs, SDGs into the daily operations. So they did it for around 500 companies from different, uh, gov uh, from different uh, um, countries around the world and the four continents. So they, so they covered the whole, let's say, uh, uh, countries um, around the world. And they figured out that 72% of these companies, they mentioned the SDGs in the reports, which is a very good number, great number. 72% of companies, they mentioned the SDGs in their reports and they say that we align. I put five lines under my word, align the SDGs uh, uh, um, into their operations. However, out of these 72%, only 25% included the SDGs into their business strategy. And I think this gap, only the 25% of them included into their business strategy, this what creates the main problems. This was what creates the ad hoc, the greenwashing, and this what creates non-consistency, the, uh, the, the scattered efforts, because it's not there into their business operations, because there is no action plan. We don't know what to need to do to help our business grow, be profitable, attract people, and at the same time, be environmentally responsible and be socially responsible. Again, out of these 25% of the organizations that they have SDGs into their business strategies, only 14% mentioned specific SDGs target. Like for example, I am targeting SDG number 13, which is climate action. And I am targeting to achieve, to reduce 10% of my carbon emissions by five years or by 10 years. And this is why I couldn't achieve them. And this is why I achieved them. Or for example, in no poverty, this is what I am aiming to achieve. This is what I am aiming to um, employ certain number of employees so that I can enhance their living standards, whatever. And out of these 14% of companies, only 1% of companies, they report quantitative measures to show their progress. And this is what I have been talking about, like, we, we need really to have quantitative measures. 
okay, we say that we align our businesses to the SDGs, but only 1% of them say that I have contributed 30% to achieve SDG number two, or I contributed by 25% to achieve SDG number five. And my plan is to increase my contribution to achieve this SDG by 30% by this number. We see this from the government, let's say locally. Yes, the government sets these standards. And yes, some companies, they do this, but not all of them. And we need really to think of quantitative measures because there is a saying that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So it's not enough anymore to say, yes, we want to achieve this goal, uh, these uh, projects, we want to target this number of people, we want to do one, two, three, four, five. No, we want to see what is our impact again. Are these projects changing the lives? Is it making the society better? Is it really enhancing the environmental resources or not? This is what we need to think. So um, we're not honestly in a sustainable path globally. And um, we have definitely climate changes. We have many threats. We have many uh, 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 future gaps in terms of what are we doing in terms of sustainability. Maybe they are not collaborating each other. And let me highlight as we as the session today talks about the environmental risks, I will focus on the environmental risks. Like the ecological footprint, it is it is the measuring um, tool. Okay, I mean, it is the, the matrix that that compares the resources um, that we take from the environment against what the ability of the of the environment to renew itself. So it's we compare how much we're taking from the environment against the ability of the environment to renew its resources. Because God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, created the natural resources in a very beautiful um, and systematic way to be able to renew it. However, if we are consuming it more faster and more harsher than what the environment really can regenerate itself, this is where the gap exists. And this is where we are seeing many environmental problems and alarming issues uh, in terms of the main issue is increase in, in the global warming. So the human use ecological resources as if we had Earth planets available every year. And this is examples, just examples, like if the entire planet will use resources as the French do, we would need two planets each year. And as the US, the, the United States do, we would need five planets each year. Because now they are they are measuring the amount of, of consumption and production, even if, for example, uh, France or the USA or any other pro countries, if these countries produce their products in another areas, such as China or where there is the, the low labor, they are counting the impact on France because this is the country who is responsible for these productions even if they are produced in another country. So that's why maybe people would say, okay, maybe it's China, why it's not China, but because in this calculation in specific, maybe in other calculations, they use other criteria, but in this calculation in specific, they relate the products for each country to the same country, no matter where it was produced, clear? So these are the some of the um, environmental, let's say, uh, problems that we are facing. So what are the shortcomings comings in, the, in the current approaches? Back to, to our question, like, what are the reasons? As, as, uh, as you said, that it is not complete or it's not comprehensive. And we only focus on uh, doing external reports. And the external reports focuses on the outcomes. Okay, and I will talk now, what do we mean by outcomes and what are the difference between the outputs and the outcomes? We don't measure our impact to make sure that we are making better decisions. Like we collect data usually, when we do reports, we collect data only for the sake of doing reports, right? 
but there is a, 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 a whole new uh, science of the, um, of the need to collect data for what? We connect data for, collect data for what? We collect data to make better decisions, okay? We collect data to see, yes, are we doing good here? Okay, let's make a decision to see how we can maintain this good practices and optimize it. But if we are collecting data that shows gaps or misleadings, okay, let's take decisions to make sure that we will reduce this gap or eliminate this negative impact and to, to replace it with positive impact. And I see lots of companies collect the same data year by year because they are used to collect this type of data. They are used to it. And some of this data, they don't use it. They don't even use it only for reporting. They don't use it to make better decisions. They don't use it to share it internally to say, yeah, see, we have a gap here. Let's work on it. So this is very important that I always try to highlight. And we don't focus on the outcomes that matters most for the sustainable development and to stakeholders. What do we mean by this? Is that, or what do we mean by outcomes? Outcomes in Arabic here nataj, okay, and nataj. So we mean what are the outcomes of any activity? Or in other words, as I said, what is the impact of any activity? So for example, I'll give you an example here. Um, one very short example and one very long example because we're talking about environmental risks. So I will try to give you an example about environmental risks. Just a quick one that it's just food for thought. Sometimes we go and do tree planting activities uh, and we go, we, tree, we, we plant trees, we put seeds, we, we, uh, we water them. But some of these actions, okay, these are what? These are the outputs. We planted 100 trees, yes. Uh, we engaged uh, 300 uh, employees, bravo, very good. We engaged their families. We talked a lot about environment. We talked uh, about the importance of planting trees. Very good, very good. Check out of the list. This is done, objective is done. The, uh, the, the activity is successful. However, this is the, what is this? This is the output. This is the activity. But if we look at the outcome, like if we come back after a year, are these trees bigger? Are these trees were planting the right type of trees in the right? I'm just giving you a very simple question and you can have a very simple example and you can apply it to other examples. Are these trees really helpful? Will, will, will they help me to do or to enhance environmental resources or I will only consume water because these plants are not um, uh, suitable for this area and there's no one to look after them. There is no one to take care of them. Maybe, and I saw it in my, in, in another country, like these trees were completely destroyed. No one is taking care of them. There's no water resources around and this activity were, uh, uh, was with zero impact. However, at the records of the company, this activity was done with 100% successful, but in reality, the impact is zero. Do you see that what I'm meaning? This is a very simple example. We did another example, like social related example. We did a project with um, orphans and um, um, companies that used to take orphans to do uh, recreational activities. They take them in certain seasons to do some events, um, draw a smile on their faces, take photos. And when we did, an impact measurement and management on the orphans to see if the life of orphans has been changed. Because this organization, they provide scholarships for the orphans. And they wanted to see if these scholarships are changing their lives, they're making them more independent, more successful. So when, when I personally talk about with, with the orphans, some of them said that these recreational activities makes their lives worse because they feel um, less needed, they feel abandoned, they feel that they are missing a lot in the community. So in terms, again, for the company, yes, we did many activities with the community to engage volunteers, and we have this number of volunteers, this is done successful. However, when you go and speak with the beneficiaries, zero impact. So what we did, 
after we collecting this data, going back to my first point, make decision. So after we collected this, we said, see, the orphans, they're not happy about it. They're making their lives worse. They're feeling abandoned. Psychologically, they're not happy. So they we make decision to change this project and the volunteering project to make it more strategic. So we said all volunteers, instead of going one time or two time to engage with them, let's uh, take these volunteers to make um, uh, to, to educate these orphans. So each volunteer would go once weekly to teach them math, science, uh, and Arabic language for these orphans so that they can feel more connected. So you can't imagine the difference in the impact level on the volunteers and on the orphans. So this is what I'm talking about. Like, yes, we do a lot of investments in sustainability projects. So why there are many environmental catastrophes? Why there are many social catastrophes? Because we don't look at the impact. And again, we don't plan our strategies, maybe if we have a strategy, according to the stakeholders' needs and according to the business needs. See the difference? We need to talk with the stakeholders. We need to talk with our beneficiaries. What do you need? What are your expectations? What, what are your priorities? What do you expect from us? What do you need from us? And then I align their needs with my business objectives. And based on this, I uh, uh, develop my strategy and develop my actions. And after implementing the actions, I go back to see what's the impact. Did I really change their lives? What is, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it intended? Did I plan to do this? Or there are many unintended? impact um, so they don't as, as well the current approaches sometimes we don't fully understand the interdependencies between the SDGs and the, the the business objectives as I said like we we really separate the SDGs from our business of uh, from our business um, uh, strategy transactional focus like we focus mainly on the capital and profit and the quick uh, gains, quick uh, economic gains. Uh, don't set ambitious goals. We need to set really ambitious goals and see how we're going to achieve them. And often in each activity, we said that it's a hit and run approach, limited involvement of affected stakeholders. All of this we have mentioned before, the limited, sorry, involvement of affected stakeholders, whether it is before setting the, the activity or the strategy and after that, before so that I can understand what do they want, what do they need. And this is what we call materiality analysis, to understand what is important for my stakeholders. Maybe the community that I want, they need education, for example. This community, I'm working in this community, and uh, their need, the real need, is education. They don't have a school. The, the nearest school is, let's say, eight kilos far away. So they don't have really a school. And the company says, mm, OK, I want to give them a project about agriculture so that I give money to small farmers, to small agriculture, and let's build up their farming. So it is a good project to give farmers. However, is this their main need? Farming, is this their main need? Maybe it is a need, but not at the first priority. Their priority is education. So if I keep on giving them food or, or, or agriculture and food and agriculture, maybe, maybe minimal impact would be achieved. But if I get them the expectations that they want, if I give them education, if I built up a school for them, I'm just giving, as I said, maybe not practical examples, but to try to direct your thoughts into the direction of impact and how to engage with these stakeholders. Uh, and confusion and uh, con um, uh, like, um, yes, do we have? Yes, do we have uh, someone who wants to talk something? Is it clear? OK. And there is, as I said, there is a confusion, let's say, between the SDGs and the ESG. I want to, now to ask you, 
What do you know about the ESG? What, what is the ESG, let's say? What is the ESG? What do you think is the ESG? Who would like to share? What is the ESG? What do you know about the ESG? We have been talking about them a lot and they have been gaining very strong focus in the companies, in the media, in all sessions, in all uh, events. ESG, ESG, ESG. What is the ESG? Environmental, social, and governance responsibility. Yes. It's ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance. Do you know, Siham, the difference between them and the SDGs? Because we said as well, the SDGs, they focus on the social, environmental, and economic. Anyone has any idea about the difference? Let me uh, go into explaining. You need to know what is the difference between the approach of the ESG and the approach of the SDGs. So the ESG, they were created as a risk management approach, okay, focused on enterprises. And this is very important to, to focus on. So the ESG, it takes the outside in approach. As I said, it's a risk management approach. So the question that ESG asks is, what are the environmental, social, and governance factors that can impact my work. Clear? So it looks at the external social, environmental, and governance aspects and how it impacts my internal operations. So this is the ESG question, how these factors impact me. So it looks at the outside in approach. However, the SDGs looks at the inside out approach, which is how my operations, this is the company, the, the, the blue circle is the company, how my operations impacting the social, environmental, and economic, approach, economic factors. Can you see the difference between these two approaches? So this is a risk management approach because based on the ESG and the risk assessment, because honestly, if I am a company, and there is environmental catastrophes surrounding me. Will I be able to manage my work effectively? No, maybe. Will I be able to be profitable? No. If I am working in a very cracked society or not like not strong society, will I be able to be profitable? No. So they assess or analyze the risks, the external risks and how it impacts the business operations. And the SDGs, it looks how my operations, how is my industries, how my business practices are impacting from my emissions, impacting the environmental resources and impacting the social resources. So honestly speaking, during my work with the UNDP, they were trying to, uh, and now the global the global direction, I know that this locally, maybe it's new for you, but globally with the UNDP, they try to move from the ESG towards the SDGs. They don't, they don't adopt the ESG in all the practices within the UNDP. They only adopt the SDGs because it is not enough to assess the external factors and see how it is impacting your business and now to align your businesses and to reduce this risk without introducing solutions to, the, to these environmental and social factors. Do you know, do, do you see what's the difference between them? And honestly, I, I always try to highlight this because we use now ESG mainly, it is used now as a symbol, not, not symbol, but as a term to that, that equals sustainability. However, it's true, but we need to understand the different approaches. What's the approach of the ESG and what's the approach of the SDGs? Yes, both of them, they, they reflect sustainability, but everyone has its own approach. Is this clear? Okay. Um, now the, the point um, that, that I wanted to highlight is that 
There is the term of, I mentioned it at the beginning, uh, that is called IMM, which is Impact Measurement and Management. And this term as well comes from the ESG and the SDGs. Like the ESG, you need to assess the risks that happening and the SDGs assesses your impact. The risk as a company that I am doing on the environment, like now we are, we are attending a session, right? There's impact happening. Like you as a human uh, who wakes up every day, uses the water, uses their car, we're now using electricity. So we're creating impact. Every human being, forget about where you work or what you do or what's your company or what's your industry, you are creating an impact. And the impact I like, or, or why, why I'm so much passionate about the impact is that because we really need to take care of it and to be aware of it as human beings, not only as sustainability advocates. So we need to understand the impact measurement. So let's say, I'll ask you a question. Um, we, let's say that we implemented an activity. We did an activity, we did a social activity, and we need to, to look at the impact. So is it enough to ask the beneficiaries or to ask you now, or any volunteer who, who, who participated in the activity. Is it enough to ask them, were the session impactful? Or were the session good for you? Is it enough to ask this question or not? Like, will it give me the right perspective of the activity if I ask them, was it beneficial for you or not? Was it impactful or not? Is it enough? Yes, Khadija. Okay. Do you think we need more information to understand the impact? Was Wasik, yes, also. Okay, so Khadija and Wasik, let me, and everyone, of course, let me ask you another question. Siham says more details are required. Yes, let me ask you a question. Khadija and Wasik and everyone. Um, let's say uh, now uh, an Nisr al-Dhahabi training center wants to know if this session was impactful because it's not enough to say, yes, Khulud attended, yes, 50 people attended, we do that for 20 minutes, successful, done. It's not enough, as we said, we need to look at the impact. So let's say an Nisr al-Dhahabi said, Let's gather these 50 people and ask them a question to see the impact of the session. So I say, Khadija, was this session impactful for you? Yes or no? If I say yes, is it enough for you? Like, don't you need to look at further, like how impactful it was? Like maybe it's fact impactful, you just understood what are the terms but maybe you didn't understand what is impact. Like we need to know how far it is good or how far it is not good or what is the size of the change? Because honestly, as Siham says, we need to know more. We need to get more information. Is it impactful? Yes or no? Fine. We need to know more. How impactful it was. Maybe it was impactful two out of 10. Is it enough for a Nisr al-Dahabi to be impactful two out of 10? Is it enough? No, it's not enough to be impactful two out of 10. Like people didn't know new information only two out of 10. Exactly. Is it enough maybe five out of 10? Or maybe we need eight out of 10, this is our target. So we need to know in measurable terms how impactful it was. So we need to measure the impact. It's quantitative. I know that there's a change happened. So I know that there is a change, but how big is the change? Is it small change or big change? Is it positive change or negative change? So I need to know this environmental problems that happened, especially when we're talking about environmental problems as we are now talking about environmental risks. Is it enough to know, yes, there is environmental change uh, or environmental problem, and we need to know how big or small this environmental change. And based on that, I make a decision, which we call impact management, 
to, to, to make a decision to reduce this environmental problem and to introduce practices to eliminate this environmental risk and eliminate this uh, environmental factors. Is it clear? So this is what we call, and this is very important in assessing environmental problems, because when we go and identify these environmental problems, we need to know how big is these environmental problems, how they are impacting the surrounding community. Is it impacting their living standards? Is it impacting their health? Is it impacting their um, well-being, right? And based on that, we need to take the action to reduce these things. And now we will talk later about what are the actions that we need to take to eliminate these risks. Um, clear, would you like to, is there any question? Okay. So now um, let's talk about really get deep dive into the current environmental uh, challenges or the current environmental risks. What do you think the cities will look like in 2050? Just imagine how cities will look like in 2050. Now we're 2023. And there are huge change in cities by 2050. Some people would say, Khulud, what's, what, uh, what do we have to do now cities and we're talking about environmental risks? But change in cities is the main, let's say, source of environmental problems. They are expecting this. Why? By 2050, the global population will reach 9 billion people. 9 billion people, 55% of them will be living in cities. So by living in cities, 55% of the 9 billion people, you can imagine the pressure that there will be on the natural resources and the environmental resources. Why? Because we need infrastructure. We need services, we need houses, we need schools, right? We need, we need everything. We need transportation, we need uh, waste management, we need energy, we need water supplies, all of them in cities. And already by now, as we talk, cities, they represent almost two thirds or consumes two thirds of the global energy demand. Two thirds is on cities. So you can imagine by the increase but for the 9 billion people by 55%, you can imagine that the global energy demand will, uh, um, uh, will, will double. And currently cities, they release 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. So 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions that are released now, they are caused by cities. So, so like you can imagine how it will be in 2025, urban dwellers will still be the most exposed to high consideration of air pollution. So what does that mean to you? What are the environmental risks related to this fact that I'm telling you? Nine billion people, they will be in cities, high uh, demand uh, consumption of natural resources. And now currently, 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions are from cities. So can you imagine what type of risk, environmental risks in specific, that there will be by 2050? What do you think? Just share with me what are the environmental risks that there will be by 2050? Just say anything that comes into your mind. Digital, digital city will be okay i maybe I, I couldn't understand this khadija said there are many things that we can add and work on always because reality changes and we must take into account the change and find alternative plans to ensure the correct progress on the plan exactly weather pollution yes azudin definitely um like air pollution this is one of the most important environmental risks that is going to happen and is going to increase. First, environmental pollution. What else? What else? Sorry. What else? Only weather will be impacted or the air pollution and the extreme weathers. Maybe Azudan said, uh, he, like he said, weather. 
and the sea, like maybe increase in the sea levels. Health, exactly, Saeed. Health problems, because all environmental risks, they are directly related to the health. All of them, if you think of it, it is all of them related to the health. What else? There are really many. What else? Air pollution, uh, waste generation, see how I'm sorry, I missed it. Waste generation, resource depletion, air pollution, definitely, Siham. This is definitely what are the main challenges that we will be facing. And all of this, they are related to carbon emissions. So cities, uh, I'll give you facts as well. Cities, they produce 50% of global waste. So this is what Siham mentioned, is that waste management will be one of the major risks and factors that we need to act on. And very good, and luckily we here at the UAE, we have a very good waste management plan that is done by the, by the government and for the energy as well. And for the waste, let's say, if I want to focus on the waste, we have the plan of uh, um, um, uh, circular economy, which really manages the waste in a very beautiful way to reduce the amount of waste goes to the landfill. And as well, we have a project that reduces waste to energy project. So, uh, but by 2050 global, let's say it's estimated globally that the level of municipal waste will double. But um, this is a very alarming number as well, is that 80% of food waste, uh, of food, sorry, is consumed in cities. And at the same time, water stress and water consumption will increase by 55%. And this is also what you have mentioned in the chat now, is that water stress will be happening. And as we're talking about food consumed in cities, let me tell you, just it popped up in my head, and as we are now for, to, talking about uh, food waste, uh, like you can't imagine how much food waste we are producing in the Arab region. At an average, around 2 kgs to 2.5 kgs are produced per person per day of food waste in the Arab region. And this number doubles during Ramadan. So almost 5 kgs per person per, per day is produced of food waste per person per day, 5 kgs. So people might think that food waste is organic, it's fine, it will be anyway um, uh, decomposed in, the, in, the, uh, in nature. However, food waste is responsible of methane gas. And methane gas, as now said, it impacts the health. So food waste is not okay. Uh, we use a huge amount of water to produce food, and then food is wasted. So you see this cycle. So when wasting food, we're wasting a huge amount of water, and we already have water stress. So um, another social challenge is inequalities, like in cities mainly, income inequalities are higher than other places, and rich, the gap between the rich and poor is very, uh, is very high, and will gain uh, high, uh, let's say, gaps between the rich and the poor, inequalities, and unequal distribution of resources, and as well the access to goods and services, access to health services, ac access to schools, et cetera, et cetera, from these uh, risks. So what should we do, really? What, sh what should we do? We should um, align our programs from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Like, yes, shareholders are important, but we shouldn't focus only on creating shareholder value and how to be more profitable and to serve the interests of the shareholders only. So we need to shift from this focus to the stakeholder capitalism, where we focus on long-term value creation for the stakeholders. So we need to engage with them, ask them about their needs, ask them about their priorities, and really work on meeting those needs while at the same time meeting the business objectives. So there is business interest. 
What are the business interests? Business interest is to increase profits, increase market share, uh, reduce costs, reduce business risks. These are the business interests. And these are the stakeholder interests, is to address climate change, to enhance well-being, public health, uh, uh, preserve natural resources, access to all type of, of services. So the combination between the business interest and the stakeholder interest, here comes the sustainability sweet spots. And here comes our sustainability strategy. So when I understand this, and I understand this, I will be able to introduce new businesses, new products, new services, new processes, sorry, not new business. Within my business, I need to produce more products, new services that meets both needs, new business models. So I'd be more creative, more innovative, in introducing new models that meets both needs. Some people might think, oh, this is, this is costly, Khulud. We can't do this. It's not our priority. We're going into really harsh time. But believe me, and I've seen it a lot with different organizations. When you engage both together, companies really start to shine. How shine? In terms of, let's say, reputation, you will become the customer of, you will attract the customer, you will become, you, your product will become the choice for the customers. Customers are starting to be really aware about, yes, I want to go with responsible products. I want to go with good products that supports good reasons. I will not go with products that supports bad reasons, although they might be um, financially more reasonable for me. So customers start to be really aware, to be really responsible. So first, you focus on the reputation. And when, when the companies gain this reputation and you start to attract more customers, you start to attract more employees, the best talents in the community, you widen your market share. You have competitiveness. You know what does it, what do you mean by competitiveness? Like you'll be more comparable or when, when you compete with other, let's say, uh, competitors, you start to gain higher level than the competitors. So this is what we call by competitiveness. And this impacts your profitability at the longer term. So this is the, the change in perspectives that we need to do. Currently, organizations, they see themselves separate than the environment or the planet and the society. But we need, this is the old way, but we need to, see, organizations need to see themselves as part of the economy and the economy is part of the society, and the society is part of the environment. And we interact with it always, and it's a very dynamic interaction between the organization and the economy and the society and the environment. So this is how we need to um, change the perspective. And the strategy, the sustainability strategy, need to serve the economy, need to serve the society, and need to serve the environment. Um, now, the, the second part or and the last part uh, of the session, I will talk for around, let's say, 15 or 20 minutes, and then I will open the chance, the last 15 minutes for Q&As. So let's say the second part is really analyzing, um, again, just to highlight what are the environmental risks and how to take action to eliminate these environmental risks and not to eliminate it, to minimize it. Because unfortunately, many of the environmental problems are irreversible. Like once it happens, it happens. Like now the increase in the global temperature or the global warming by 1.5, we can't reduce it to one. But the challenge is not to increase it to two. You know what I mean, to two uh, degrees. So. The environmental pollution, what, once it happens, it's irreversible. So we need to minimize or to, um, to protect other environmental catastrophes from, from happening. So as you said before, uh, just to um, um, brief, uh, most of the environmental challenges and add of them, uh, add on top of what you have said, is that we have air pollution, we have water scarcity. Currently, we have water scarcity. And let's face it, 
yes, we have many environmental ch uh, water challenges because water is scarce. And for example, my country, um, Jordan and Palestine, Jordan in specific, it is the most poorest or the poorest country in water resources. So we have we, we are facing uh, a water problem, uh, uh, waste, quali uh, sorry, water quality, waste management problem. Sorry, here there is a typo. Waste management problem. Yes, we have a lot of pressure on the waste, how they are managed. We need to call for more reusing, recycling, refurbishing, repurposing the waste to, so that we reduce the amount of waste that goes to the landfill and increase the amount of waste that, that comes back to the economy through the circular economy. Like two days before I had a, a, a training with DIWA employees about circular economy and how to really engage it and incorporate it into our daily operations to reduce the amount of waste that goes to the landfill. Food security is another huge problem and energy consumption is another um, uh, challenge or risk that we need to look at and look into other uh, solutions and other um, uh, options such as here in, in the UAE, we're looking into the hydrogen energy uh, uh, source, solar energy source. And you know the fact that by 2050, the plan is that 50% of the carbon emissions will be reduced by using clean energy uh, sources. Like 50% of the energy consumption, it will be from uh, clean energy sources, whether it is solar, hydrogen, and other uh, projects. Uh, that are being implemented. So now what, what, what action we, sh we should do? What, we know all of this and we know theoretically this is there and we believe in it. So what sh should we do? So um, the SDG impact standards, this is where we, uh, I used to work with them um, uh, recently. So they came up with standards, okay? They call the SDG impact standards. These standards, they help organizations to align their businesses, as we, as we were talking a lot now, to align their businesses to be more impactful and to contribute to achieve the SDGs. So they said, if you as a company want to reduce the environmental risks, and contribute better to the social risk and contribute to the SDGs, you need to follow these four main directions or four main um, uh, solutions. The first one is strategy, okay? And this is what I am a true believer in doing a strategy. Now we will, we will highlight them one by one. Then a management approach. The second standard is the management approach. The third one is transparency. And the last one is governance. And here in the middle, we're talking about awareness and strategy is the first step. Now we will say, and then management approach and then reporting and governance. And it's a continuous cycle that never stops. Let's take them one by one, one standard by one standard. It's, it's honestly, it's a beautiful course that stays for two, two days training course that we go in depth, each standard, how to do it, how to implement it, and what are the steps that we can do it in order to be uh, more impactful and, and leave an impact uh, in the community. So the first standards, it, talk, it talks about uh, strategy. So first, what do we need to do? We need to raise awareness. We need to raise awareness for the external stakeholders and for our employees as well. Because I see also organizations that they raise awareness for the external stakeholders, like the customers, the community, the partners, the investors, and they forget their employees. And the employees, they don't know what are the CSR actions that are adopted by the company. And this is completely wrong, because if you want to implement sustainability practices, as I said, my slogan is inside out. So raise awareness of the internal employees through different tools, like maybe through emails, campaigns, 
activities, go out for volunteering activities and talk a lot about it, uh, make sustainability champions program, make a committee, and the list goes on. But we need to raise awareness to change in the mindset, to change how we think, what are our, our directions in thinking. So this is the first one in strategy. The second one is to set clear goals and objectives. Our strategy needs to set out what are the goals that I need to adopt, and they are they need to be smart goals, like specific, measurable, achievable, reliable, and time related. So based on these smart goals, I need to align them with the SDGs. As we said before, some companies, and I saw this miss. Um, uh, like um, some of the um, uh, like misunderstandings is that companies, they look at the SDGs and they choose which SDG they want to align or, or they want to work with. However, the thing is that you as a business, you set your objectives and goals, and then you see what are these objectives and goals aligned with the SDGs and not the opposite way. It's not that you choose the SDGs and then you incorporate them into your business, but you see your business first. Because if, you, if, if the SDGs are not aligned and really matches and dissolves within your business, it will not be sustained, like it will not be uh, long-term. It will be really, um, it will last only for, for, for short-term period of time because the SDGs need to really be uh, dissolved, as I said, within your business operations. The last one, add new KPIs. Please, these KPIs should go from the outcomes, as we said. We should go beyond the outcomes, which are number of activities, number of people, number of volunteers, amount of investments, amount of uh, beneficiaries, blah, blah, blah. We need to focus on the outputs, which are the impacts. So new KPIs should be like number of beneficiaries who I enhance their living standards, for example. Number of employees who started to have better service, access to services, to health services. Number of people who are more satisfied, number of employees. We need to look into the change. We need to look into the impact. Number of resources that I, I, I preserved or, or uh, amount of carbon emissions that I reduced and to be actual numbers, you know? So change the KPIs from outcomes to outputs. And uh, identify your vision and mission, you know, based on the, after I raised awareness and after I set my goals and objectives and KPIs, it's good sometimes to revisit your mission and vision and to inject some environmental or social dimensions into your vision because it sets the journey. Because the vision, it's what are you envisioning to do in the future? And social and environmental aspects should be injected into this. So I always advise to revisit your your vision and mission and make it aligned with the sustainability or with the with the environmental or social um, dimensions that you are working on or make it towards sustainability or some companies they choose to have separate vision and mission for sustainability but it is also aligned with their business objectives for example we are the best sustainable banking sector in the arab region for example we are the best uh, banking sector that provides green bonds in the Arab region. I'm just giving you an example. So like to have a clear vision and mission and again, share it with the whole employees and raise awareness. So now the first step, yes, we have a strategy, we have a strong one. We identified our uh, business goals or our sustainability objectives, our goals. I added the new KPIs. I have an action plan. And now what's next? Next is, uh, oh, sorry. Before that, I wanted to show you how a sustainability strategy looks like. 
this is in brief like we need to have a focus area like if i one of my main focus areas in the sustainability strategy is to have environmental conservation or to conserve natural resources i need to ask myself why am i doing this the first question is why to reduce carbon emissions and to do responsible financing for example and then the other question is how am i going to do this so i need to ask myself why am i doing it and how am i going to do it because when you answer the question of why you know how to do it and and how to do it so the how sets the action plan how is that for example i want to introduce new program to monitor my consumption i want to replace the light bulbs with led bulbs i want to encourage employees to use the stairs for example instead of the elevator i want to be a signatory uh, for certain projects i want to revise all my lending uh, procedures this is for example for banks i set an action plan that identifies how i am going to achieve my objectives and these are some examples of the kpis or the new kpis that will be introduced uh, based on these action plan so this is an example or one part of a strategy that tackles one focus area and this should happen on the rest of the focus areas for example if you have one environmental conservation to um, uh, social development capacity building you need to do the same answer the questions of why am i doing this and then how am i going to do this and then share it with everyone and add new kpis clear okay um, unfortunately, because of the time constraints, I'm just giving you this information as a top notch and I'm trying to cover everything just to give you the main high level information of how to do it, what are the direction, and then you can do it at a more depth. Uh, the second, so now I am, I'm having a strategy, a beautiful, strong strategy. We're having a mission and a vision and the focus areas. We have the action plan and we have shared it with everyone. So what's next? If I have this strategy, beautiful one, and I close it the paper and put it in the drawer, it has no, it has zero value. So what I need to do it is that I need to bring this strategy into action to, to, to drive it into action to, to real life. So I need to translate it into real life, to translate it into action. So what should I do? Here comes the business approach or the management approach. I have a strategy, it's on the paper, it's still internal. Now I need to go wider. So I need to engage with the stakeholders to tell them that this is my strategy and check what are their priorities, what are their needs, identify proper engagement tools. I need really to engage with the stakeholders. Stakeholders could be employees, could be the government, could be the society, could be the environment, it could be the suppliers, of course, it could be different groups uh, or uh, individuals who impacts the organization or impacted by its operations. And then I need to check my internal operations to make sure that your internal operations are environmental friendly and to introduce new environmental friendly operations. I added just here some uh, very wide examples like green procurement practices. Do How many of you practice green, green procurement practices? Do we have anyone who practice green procurement practices? Like, yeah, the regional network for social responsibility is one of the most important things to achieve the vision direction. Yes, thank you uh, as, a, as a dean, uh, because yes, I agree, because like to have a network is one of the most important things so that you can share, you can set direction um, uh, for uh, and to identify the roles uh, for uh, um, environmental and social responsibilities. So I want to listen from you. What are the operations that can be adopted um, um, to say that, yes, this is environmentally responsible operations. I have examples like green procurement. I have examples like digitalization. But I want to hear from you. What do you think 
we can adopt internally to be more environmentally responsible and reduce the environmental risks. Who can give us examples, whether you're adopting it or not, whether you know it maybe. What do you think um, are some examples of environmental actions that we can adopt into our operations? Any thoughts? No thoughts? <laughs> okay, so I will I will share some examples. Can I see? Can I share? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. The, about environmental, as we are uh, uh, organization for disabled, we try to in, uh, do that in our environment to recycling for the right. electricity, the water, the papers, and mm -hmm. the printers also. All this environmental, you know, and the greening. We try to every year to count how many plants we are planting in our area because the pollutions. These things what we are doing in our area and everything we have a measurement, yearly measurement, oh. how much we are right. totals for everything for the environment. Hmm. Thank you, Khadija. That's really great to know that you are adopting several uh, um, environmental projects. But the most important thing that Khadija mentioned is that we measure it. We know that this year, for example, we had we have achieved this certain amount of emissions but maybe it is less than we planned and it's less that we can achieve. So why? Maybe the message was not good. Maybe the awareness was not good. Maybe the practices was not very proper. So let's change. Let's make another decision. Let's make another program, right Khadija? Like maybe uh, we're adopting recycling. Yes. Let's say the amount of recycling that you were planning for, let's say for example, it is um, 10 kgs to be recycled. But then at the end, after measuring it, you saw that you have achieved only five. Why? Yeah. So maybe it's the awareness. Maybe it's the um, uh, suppliers. Maybe it's the type of products that you are purchasing ca can't be recycled. You see, so it impacts the whole thinking system. The whole strategy, the whole strategy system that you are you have been uh, adopting yeah, and Khadija, another question: Do you do environment? Do you do awareness sessions for your employees about this? Yes, for all the stockholders, you know, employees. Also, we have the group of the environment in our with the teachers, with the heads, with the people, the environment, and the everything. We implement all the environment in our yearly plan. Every mm -hmm. we are around twenty-five schools. Uh, branches, uh, centers, and uh, administrations, uh, a department, and all of them, they have a planned year plan, which they implement the, in the uh, environment in everything, you know. We take mm -hmm. care of them. Even we have the, like a school, the buses. Since mm -hmm. before, uh, since we start the sustainability report, because we were using diesels and the petrol. Mm -hmm. Since three years, we stopped all our passes are using the petrol, not diesels, because diesels right. is giving you the pollution. And the, mm. we try our best to try to, you know, take right. care of our mm. environment, because if we take care of our environment, we will be really uh, in healthy er environment in that. Mm. Even for our glasses, for the uh, teachers and the students, we measure the area in the glasses, if the air, mm. air pollution is, really health or not we try with the corporation with the ministry municipality to try mm -hmm. to measure and then they give us the result that it is a safety area to you know teach the student there in the classes mm -hmm. great thank you so much Khadija. this is a very um, new highlights of examples of what what you are doing and i'm sure a lot and many of you you're doing the same and you have many, uh, uh, let's say, uh, actions that you have been taking to implement. And as Khadija said, in, in our operations, we really need to engage every single one. And by one, I mean stakeholders and I mean the employees. So for example, the green procurement, I need to engage with my suppliers and tell them, see, my organization, I need to purchase 
only green products. What do I mean by green products? Like, is it only recycled paper? No. I mean green products like to look at the products, at the packaging of the products. Do you use plastic packaging? And do you deliver it to me, as Khadija said, by hybrid cars or by petrol or by diesel or by electric cars? and start giving, you know, you do the due diligence process. In the due diligence process, where you give, uh, where you give, where you compare the different suppliers, right? Like before purchasing anything, you need to have three offers, right? So start giving uh, points and prefer those offers that provide these options, the options of less packaging, of reusable products, of recyclable products. And there's another way of being able to return the product to these suppliers after you finished using them. So some suppliers, they say, yes, after you finish using this product, you can give it back to me, such as laptops, for example, such as electro electronics. They are some suppliers, they give the chance to give them back to them where they reuse them. They refurbish them, for example, and some of the companies, they use their pro these laptops, for example, if they are old and cannot be processed anymore, uh, they uh, break it down into pieces and they break it down into uh, raw material. So they put the metal alone, the glass alone, and they resell these raw material to other people to reproduce them into new products. You know what I mean? So this type of green procurement helps us achieve the circular economy. Like for example, each company and each organization and each one in our houses, we have furniture. So what do we do with our furniture? Do we throw them away when we're done? Or there's a concept of sharing and the concept of reusing. For example, there are many uh, organizations that they might reuse it, or there are some organizations, as I said, that they re industries that they recut them down into raw material and produce something new. So this is what we call repurposing and reducing the waste amount that goes to the landfill. And again, I will want to stress this is this type of the material waste like uh, mobiles, laptops, furniture, whatever that is created. But there's another type of waste, which is the organic waste and the food waste that I urge you as parents, as individuals, as humans to reduce and to monitor the amount of waste. I'm not sure if we have anyone from the attendees in the um, in working in, in hotels or in the, um, uh, in the hospitality sector where there are huge amount of waste. However, a very good practices have been taken here in the UAE to monitor the amount of, way of food waste that has been produced so that they can be able to manage it. As I said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So they started to monitor the amount of rice, for example, in big hotels being wasted, the amount of bread being wasted, the amount of milk being wasted, and therefore they're trying to take actions to reduce the waste by minimizing the amount of rice being, being cooked or by assessing the actual number of people who will visit and cook the amount as per the expected number of people, you know? So there are many actions that have been being taken uh, but I'm adding here the ones that can be adopted by all organizations of all sectors and all types and all sizes. Digitalization. Everything can be digitalized. Everything can be digitalized. So this can reduce the amount of paper that is produced. Hybrid cars usage, as, as uh, Khadija said, like they're, they're not using um, uh, uh, diesel anymore and they're, they're trying to take a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, plastic waste management. And here, I don't want to ask you, but for any organization that's still using plastic water bottles, please, please, we need to stop this because it is an environmental catastrophe. And I want you to calculate it when you oh, go oh, back oh, to oh, your oh, offices. Oh, Sorry? Okay, maybe it's something by mistake. So just to measure 
the amount of plastic bottles that has been disposed every day. And think about the water that still, like people don't drink the whole bottle of water, by the way. Like there's a study, a behavioral study that has been done that they saw that from the small, like maybe the half liter water bottles, they use half of it and then they throw it. So you throw water and you throw plastic, right? So try to introduce new uh, um, programs to remove this. Like for example, add water dispensers or add filters and distribute reusable water bottles, for example, for employees, write messages on them just to try to reduce plastic uh, bottles. Then collect data, as I said, collect the right data from the right people at the right time and, and create an internal system for data collection. There are many systems now, by the way, online systems that you can create to collect data and ask the different departments to add this data, maybe monthly, maybe quarterly, that helps you to measure, to measure your KPIs. If you recall in the strategy step, we have certain KPIs and these KPIs need to be measured by data collection. So ask the different departments in the organization, like the procurement department, the HR department, the real estate department, the all departments, they need to be engaged in this type of data collection so that you can be able to make the decision and really assess what you have been doing. Identify the, need, the team. This is also uh, very crucial so that you can engage all of the team together to set one direction and to clarify. And this is part of the raising awareness. But after raising the awareness in the strategy, I need to bring them into action. Like maybe some companies, they create a champions program. Some companies made, um, uh, made a committee for the environment, uh, an environmental committee, just to be able to monitor if the departments are doing green procurement, if the IT are digitalizing, if the, the, uh, the operations department, they're using hybrid cars, if they are reducing plastic bottles, if the procurement department, they're purchasing um, uh, good products. So this is the champions program, include employees, start to recognize these employees, give them incentives, you know, uh, and assign the tasks for the employees. And finally, my favorite part is impact measurement and management. After doing all, all of this, we need to know if our strategy is impactful or not, right? Maybe my strategy is not good enough. Maybe my strategy needs to be enhanced. So you need to do an impact measurement and management to see what is the impact that you are doing. Um, so uh, now um, after, after the, um, um, the, the management approach, we need to go into the third dimension of the transparency. So first I made a strategy. I brought this strategy into action and I translated it into action by the management approach. I made an action plan. I adopted environmental programs. I created a team. I made impact measurement and management. And now comes the part of the reporting. Now comes the part of the reporting. And it's not the opposite way. I don't start with reporting. I start with strategy and then management approach, and then I report on the strategy and the management approach. Is it clear? So this is where comes the reporting. The reporting comes at a later stage. So I need to move from fragmented, voluntarily, unregulated, not assured, not assured reports that comes from not having a strategy and not from practicing it, unfortunately. And some of them, they focus on climate related and carbon reductions, that's it. Some organizations, yes, they do measure their carbon. And yes, they do focus on climate change. But what about the overall business direction to be environmentally responsible or sustainable or, or socially responsible? So we need to move from this superficial reporting against SDGs. And if you recall my, um, my the numbers from the PWC, uh, uh, study 
that 72% of them, they do these reports, but these reports might be scattered, not uh, focused, and they are superficial and, and greenwashed. And to move into more coordinated, consolidated, mandated and regulated and assured. And why it is regulated? Because I have a strategy and I have a management approach and I report on them year by year. So I compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Because if I don't have a strategy, this year I will report on carbon emissions, the next year I will report on volunteers, the last year I will report on whatever. So I don't really have something focused and regulated. Reporting against underlying SDG targets. That's why I, we don't need only to focus on the 17 SDGs. As I said, each or the whole SDGs, they have 169 targets that I need to look at. And not only on the SDGs, it is really, I don't understand what are the SDGs are related to. And that's why we're not being able to achieve them because we don't understand the real targets of the SDGs, the 169 targets. We need to look at these targets and to report against these targets, not only the broader SDGs more scrutiny and accountability. So um, the tips is that really to be balanced, inclusive, uh, do not overclaim, comparable, integrated with the strategy. So uh, the reports should include uh, what's the organizational model, who are our stakeholders, what our activities, the impact value chain, uh, uh, measurement methodology, quantitative and qualitative data and stories, and what are your a business model to create this change. The last part or the third, the, the fourth part is the governance. The governance um, in very simple terms, as I like to, to recall it from a professor uh, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, during my studies, he says that the governance is the steering wheel in the car. So it's the steering wheel, how you steer your company. It's how you direct your company. So I need to integrate uh, sustainability into the governance framework, really. It has to be integrated. I need to get support from the senior managers and I need to create the culture. So it's how the company is directed, how the operation, the overall governance process of the organization needs to be aligned with this uh, direction. At the end, if I did all of this, if I adopted strategy, management approach, reporting and governance, I will have many, let's say, benefits. One of them is risk management. I will reduce uh, the environmental risks. I will enhance transparency, transparency and corporate communications, enhance customer relation. I will increase um, uh, their trust and loyalty of my customers, trust and loyalty of my employees and satisfaction. And therefore, I will increase profitability, enhance the reputation and the public image, and attract international investors because really when, when dealing with international investors, they are looking now to invest with responsible companies that are aware of their environmental risks and they work to eliminate it and enhance competitive advantage. By this, um, um, we came up with the end of my slides. I will have the last minutes uh, to um, for q and a if you have any questions anything any doubts that are not clear please um, uh, let me know share your questions there's always room for improvement um, and if you if you don't have any questions now you can reach me anytime i'm on linkedin my email is there so please uh, let me know i would love to help with anything uh, that is related to this topic. Um, and let's see if we have any questions. Anyone who's raising the hand, please let me know. Thank you, Lubna. Thank you, Bursu. Um, I really hope that this two hours were beneficial for you. Uh, I always enjoy talking about sustainability, uh, about environmental risks, social risks, and uh, we really need to integrate it. And we see a lot of change in the corporate di directions and, and change in the mindset. Uh, and we hope we can build it up more. Uh...